Well, good morning. I think we're going to go ahead and get started here this morning. It's really great to have everyone with us. Uh, really appreciate uh, uh, everyone in the audience and, and also our panelists. Uh, this is the second webinar in a series of webinars that we're doing uh, inspired by our new book, Cities of Light, uh, which explores the future of cities uh, in a world in which we uh, power them with solar energy and trying to explore both what, what does that look like for the city and what does it look like for the people who live in it. And uh, today's seminar is focused uh, on the question uh, of how do we do that? How do we get to a city that's powered by solar energy? What does that look like from a technical perspective and an economic perspective? What are the opportunities uh, that we have? Uh, and, and what are some of the, the creative kinds of approaches we could take to building out solar at uh, citywide scales? And uh, we're really uh, privileged to have with us uh, a number of great folks who've been working on that problem over the last several years. Uh, John Byrne is uh, at the University of Delaware, where he is the Director and Distinguished Professor of Energy and Climate Policy. Uh, and he's also the President of the Foundation for Renewable Energy and the Environment. Uh, and with him speaking this morning is uh, Joe Temeniao, who's a Research Principal at the Foundation for Renewable Energy uh, and the Environment. And they're going to talk to us uh, first here about um, <clears throat> How do we uh, build out citywide uh, solar uh, virtual power plants, uh, which is a really exciting idea, I think. Uh, and then uh, uh, second, uh, we're gonna have Joan Yangon, who's uh, at um, the, um, oh, I forget what SAS stands for. What does <laughs> <laughs> SAS stand for? But uh, he's, he's uh, been working on uh, similar kinds of research related to large scale solar energy deployments and, and how do we think about those uh, in relationship to urban resilience? Uh, he's gonna talk to us this morning about that. And I think particularly inspired uh, by the challenges that we've had recently, not only in places like Texas a couple of weeks ago, uh, but really over the last uh, uh, five to 10 years, we've had any number of cities that have suffered really challenging um, situations with their electricity grids. And, and so how does solar play into that uh, challenge of making a more resilient city? Uh, and then finally, uh, Chris Hansberg, who's the director of the Quest Photovoltaic Engineering Research Center uh, here at ASU and is um, uh, one of the nation's leading uh, scientists who works on the design of new kinds of solar energy technologies and solar panel technologies. And is gonna talk to us about some of the exciting uh, possibilities for integrating uh, solar panels in innovative ways uh, into urban landscapes in order to create not just clean energy, but a whole array of different kinds of functionalities. So really looking forward to today's webinar. And uh, JB and Job, I'm gonna let you guys get started. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you all, especially uh, colleagues who are west of us and uh, you're up far earlier than we are. So we're very grateful for, for the opportunity. And uh, it's always a very special pleasure to be on a panel with uh, Chris Holmesberg. It's been a while. And uh, so I'm really glad that we have this, uh, this chance together. And uh, of course, it's also a tremendous opportunity with Clark. I really enjoy the new book and um, I'm uh, very much in the recommendation mode, sending it around here, there and everywhere, uh, Clark. So, and we tried to just work Thank it you. in the title of the, uh, of the book. So Solar Cities in a New Light so that we, <laughs> we could be consistent with your, uh, your overall theme anyway. Um, so thank you all very much. And my colleague, Yop Taminio, uh, will be joining me for this round. Um, Joe, I just want to mention, uh, Nianka worked with us for a long time on these issues. And while he didn't 
uh, I didn't bother him to help us on this specific presentation. He's done so many and uh, we've published so many things together. So I certainly want to give a shout out to Joe and always uh, um, grateful for the opportunity to be with him. So uh, Yop is going to uh, take over about halfway through um, our um, our conversation with you all. And uh, so I'm going to just sort of get things kicked off and give you, if you will, an imagination of a, a city powering itself uh, significantly from solar. I'm not using any new technology. We'll wait for Chris to tell us what we can and can't do. We need the guardrails, but uh, we're using the off the shelf things at this point. And um, uh, so on that basis, we give you a depiction of how um, that can happen. And we're gonna focus on the city of New York um, uh, for that purpose. So uh, that's kind of the uh, uh, kickoff. Yope is the senior research principal. He really runs our um, research division at the foundation and uh, is key to the work that we'll be uh, discussing with you this morning. So Yope, do you want to say anything? You want me just to blast ahead? Yeah, just go ahead, JB. I'll, I'll take over halfway, like you mentioned. Okay. So uh, also in honor of uh, the more ambitious uh, vision that, uh, that, that Clark uh, talked about in his book, I just uh, take an author that I think is very important for those trying to understand how to transform cities, a guy named Lewis Mumford, and uh, um, still worth the effort to read uh, this fine work that uh, he produced over his life. Uh, he, he produced the City in History, which won a uh, all kinds of national book review awards and all kinds of things. And uh, uh, anyway, he long ago made the point that uh, our cities are the conversions of various forms of energy, not simply uh, engineered energy, but uh, all forms that give us culture, give us art uh, and give us social creativity. And um, that it's been that historic role in, in uh, um, that is so important for us to understand as we now uh, consider transforming uh, with cities uh, still again. A more contemporary statement is ours, uh, if this works. Um, so some now call the effort to build out uh, the new um, society as polycentric. It's gonna have a variety of drivers coming from a variety of both spatial and other forms and um, uh, we've been working on this specific uh, polycentric idea um, for cities themselves. And so we're going we're gonna to try and give you a bit of a picture about that. But there's also another reason why we just briefly want to share with you why cities are primed uh, to actually take a leadership role, particularly in the U.S. context. This is not for those who have been familiar with the US effort to develop a national climate policy, this is not encouraging. Um, these are all of the major bills uh, that made their way uh, into the US Congress uh, since the year 2000. Um, the first to come in was one that was under a uh, supposed, you know, a bipartisan um, approach which uh, had a uh, Senator McCain from your, uh, from ASU's uh, home uh, and uh, uh, Senator Lieberman, Lieberman representing both parties. And they tried three times to get the, the bill voted. And finally it was given a vote in 2005 and it was defeated 38 to uh, 50. So um, that's it. And it's, it's really hard to believe, but that's it. The US Congress, largely because of the failings of the Senate in the US, has never, I'm not talking about voted down, they have never voted on another national climate policy. It's really quite remarkable. Not only that, the party that has organized this, if you will, cancellation of a, a policy, the Republican Party in, in the case of the US, uh, has never produced, after the McCain-Lieberman bill, has never produced a bill. You know, you have to ask yourself in a way, 
what's going on here? Why are we a country that can't even have a vote? <laughs> we can't even, it's, uh, but that's, uh, that's our problem. We did have one vote. It's not a vote of a bill. It was voted in 2015. Uh, its sponsors were Senators Capito and uh, McConnell. And uh, the vote was to repeal a regulation that uh, uh, the, the Obama administration had put in place. Uh, I wouldn't count that as a result since it's a resolution as a bill, uh, but that's it. And, and it's remarkable that after nearly 20, uh, over 20 years, we have very little to show at the national level. Having said that, we think cities are particularly poised to take leadership roles in the United States. So what we've done here is we've been, it's not easy in the US to get the good data on city climate action plans, both their targets and their achievements. Um, so we did our best at getting some of the larger cities. And um, uh, on the left panel is the commitments that are made by these 51 cities that we could get comparable data for. Uh, so that we could project out to 2025, what was their goal uh, against uh, what was the goal before the US left uh, the Paris Agreement. And um, you can see that all of the cities uh, have uh, found ways to muster commitments to uh, much higher um, or much faster reduction in CO2 um, emissions from their activities than the U.S. Uh, national policy, um, such as it is. It wasn't really a policy. No one finally in the end could, uh, and then the, there was an effort to withdraw us from the Paris Agreement. But you can see that the commitments, and that's important because somehow we have to find leadership uh, that would take us beyond what are the rather anemic um, uh, engagements at the national level. And uh, as you probably know, when the uh, US uh, Clean Power Plan was submitted, there was already something like 35 states that already were in compliance the day that it was, it was uh, uh, published. So I, it's, we have to go well past that. We have to go fast. And you can find that ambition in the case of, um, of cities. There's other locations of, of ambition in the US, but I just wanted to Note that. And then importantly, the, the one on the right is what did these cities actually achieve? And there we had to do quite a bit of work to find 12 cities that had comparable data that we could then use to measure what was their achievements between 2005 and 2017 using a common metric. And again, what you see is an extraordinary against what the US reduction looked like during that period. This is now actual, this is achievement rather than ambition. Um, you can see the substantial role of taking the, the effort to pioneer and to find new ways uh, to think about and look about, look at uh, these opportunities. So with that in mind, we'd like to take you to a city that we think is well poised to, uh, to provide some leadership force. It's not the only city. There's a several uh, that we've worked on, but I, this one we have, uh, Yopa and I have uh, uh, got a lot of information on it at this point, so we just thought we would share it uh, with you. And that is New York City, which has an interesting requirement, which is that it has to have within its uh, jurisdiction, it has to have an ability to come back um, at peak um, from uh, any sorts of problems that might uh, happen with peak. It has to manage its grid uh, in a kind of self sufficient way. And uh, this simply gives you. Um, a, um, uh, an indication of where the power plants are of different sizes, the, the round uh, dots, you can see whether they're natural gas or whether they're petroleum or solar. And uh, you can see in this context, what the, is the city's own planning. This is not all the city, but this gives you a piece that we thought you could, you could focus on and see um, how uh, New York City intends to um, uh, deal with peak. And basically what it has mustered in these plants, these are their peak plants, they only come on a few hours in the year, but these are the plants that will allow them to meet their peak obligation. Uh, they are 10 gigawatts as of when we did the study. And uh, there's about uh, two and a half of those uh, uh, gigawatts that are available um, 
let me just, um, but they're only operating at about 10% of their capacity. Um, these plants are not ordinarily economically viable. That's why they're the last thing that the city turns on. And New York City customers have to pay a capacity payment. There's no electricity. This is paying to have the, 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 uh, the plants there. And uh, so uh, $268 million a year uh, for that purpose. And you can kind of consider what could you do with $268 million? Well, we're going to try. So we have done a complete 3D um, building model do, doing all of the uh, more than million uh, buildings in the city uh, using LIDAR data that is available through the portal of the city, um, about four and a half billion uh, data points to build out what would be uh, a, a, an accurate depiction of what the rooftop area is uh, of those buildings. And, uh, this is the sort of, uh, this is off of S3's uh, uh, tool and uh, Yoke can tell you more if you want to ask more detail on this, but um, uh, this is the image that you can um, create from uh, this data set that's, uh, that's available. And um, we just thought it was kind of interesting to see how it can even give a fairly good uh, representation of, uh, an extraordinary uh, monument of uh, the U.S. Anyway, we use this this uh, tool, this set of tools, to create that uh, uh, 3D uh, vision of the city, and then we went to work um, trying to figure out uh, how much rooftop real estate was uh, actually available for that purpose. And the other thing that we did was to figure out against load um, a bioelectrical network within the boroughs against load, what was the generation hour on hour for the entire year, okay, uh, for New York. And the dark green show you um, uh, cases where the peak is met in those uh, parts of, of the uh, city um, uh, already. This is using the standard uh, off the shelf uh, photovoltaic technology. We didn't do anything to, to push the envelope uh, on uh, its performance. Uh, we didn't use anything fancy, there is no uh, storage in this at this time, but I hope you'll understand why in a couple of minutes and uh, why we think it's an exciting depiction of what is possible. Now, you'll notice that uh, anybody that's in the sort of neighborhoods that could generate 60 to 70 percent of their electrical need at peak, um, they are in the boroughs, uh, sometimes called the people's boroughs of uh, Bronx and Brooklyn and uh, Queens and Staten Island. And of course, there is this large uh, borough that uh, is unable and will never be able <laughs> to uh, uh, generate its needs uh, from its rooftop uh, area. And um, so this sets up an interesting proposition that we'll uh, present to you. But before I do that, just to give you a matter of scale, we did run this analysis against the city's um, uh, hour on hour a low profile for each of the months, and we've just presented here two months for you, May and August, uh, which are really uh, months when when peaks are set. Um, and so this is uh, this is what the load looks like in the city off of Con Ed's uh, uh, data portal and uh, Consolidated Edison's uh, um, data portal. And uh, then we ran a standard building efficiency improvement regimen of twenty percent. Uh, which reshapes it to look something like this. And then we took just the public buildings. And in the case of the public buildings, we were able to use about 55% of the rooftop area of those buildings after running shade filters and uh, uh, angle of array and so on, which uh, Yoke will talk with you about in just a moment. Um, but we were able to then offer what could be the impact on load uh, in May and August, um, uh, but if you, you started a, a pilot program using the city's um, own buildings, if you used uh, buildings owned by government um, and uh, had those buildings as the start of this kind of program, which we thought was a good way for everybody to begin to get familiar with doing a distributed uh, virtual plant, uh, but to do it, uh, getting all the construction trades, the, the, the um, 
the permitting and so on uh, in good order. So we did that first. And then if you go beyond that to all the buildings, you get this, uh, this result. And um, this is 30% uh, of the uh, city's total area is available uh, for solar generation passing the test that again, Yoke will talk with you about in just, uh, in just a couple of minutes. And of course, the thing that usually gets a wow out of uh, folks that we show this to during the hours of roughly uh, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. with existing technology during months where peak period, peak uh, loads are set, the city of New York would have power to sell. That's what the yellow is. It's kind of interesting as a portrait of the city that we don't normally think about at all, okay? Using rooftop real estate, not having to go out and, and use farmland and so on. Um, and uh, this has a sustainability profile that I think is very important for us to consider. A lot of times um, solar and cities are poo-pooed as cities as sources of the climate problem and solar as simply requiring too much um, area uh, in order to play meaningful in, in, the, um, in the decarbonization game. And it's simply not true. It just simply is not true. Um, on, on both fronts, there, there is the ability for the city to play a significant role and there is a significant opportunity uh, for um, solar technology before Chris gives us the better uh, way to think about the technology. So, so with that in mind, that picture also gives you another understanding though of uh, how an urban virtual plant could achieve uh, goals um, of, um, of decarbonization. And that is not only to address the sustainability test, but also a justice test. <coughs> so this again is a depiction of the city in which the, the uh, blue areas uh, are the areas of, um, of uh, income, high income, uh, and the yellow areas are relatively low income. They're just about uh, you know, one tenth, one ninth of what the blue areas are in terms of income uh, per household. So um, there's an interesting outcome of this. The Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, and Staten Island have an interesting relationship with Manhattan. And that relationship, if you now began to seriously build solar into the design of the electrical system, it would mean that there would be a, um, a sale of electricity coming from the, uh, the sustainable boroughs uh, into uh, Manhattan in order to help it not, can't fully solve it just yet, but help it to close uh, the gap on its, um, its performance. And you can see on the right-hand side in the table uh, what that kind of looks like um, uh, as uh, the, uh, the different um, uh, parts of the uh, surrounding uh, or bedroom uh, boroughs uh, often, as I said, also called people's boroughs, uh, where most of the population is, um, you can see that if you take hour on hour, you take the individual hours uh, and how much those uh, boroughs are producing for their own needs uh, or their electrical networks within the borough for their own needs. And then you, then you bottle up the surplus and get it ready to sell, okay, uh, across uh, uh, the river to, uh, to Manhattan. And the outcome is roughly a $734 million transfer of revenue from Manhattan to um, uh, the boroughs based upon the existing TOU rates used already by the city. We didn't, we didn't play any fancy games <laughs> with that calculation, okay? And uh, the result is that uh, it is feasible to actually plan sustainability and justice at the same time into uh, the new city. We don't have to make the error that the, uh, that the industrial city made. We don't have to leave um, an electrical system that impoverishes some 
while benefiting others. We could actually create uh, something that is more approximately uh, fair and equal uh, while also rapidly decarbonizing um, city economy. So that's, uh, that's my part. And I'm going to shut up now and turn it over to, uh, to Yope. But Yope's going to tell me, Yope, you want me to, you want to stay on this one or you want to go to the next one? Uh, no, you can just uh, move forward to the next one. All righty. Thanks a lot, JB. Appreciate it. Um, so with the relationship described uh, by JB just now, um, you can indicate uh, a financial transfer, but obviously there's also a range of concerns associated with an energy uh, infrastructure that is located in uh, a vulnerable areas of the city. So um, we illustrated the flood zones, for instance, for uh, the peak uh, power plants. But in addition to that, those peak uh, power plants are uh, roughly all built in the 60s, some even in the 50s, 1950s um, and in the 70s. So they're old, um, they contribute quite a significant share of environmental pollutants in the city. Um, so if you uh, transition the energy system infrastructure to a solar city, you would have uh, air pollution benefits uh, improvements that have a direct improvement for the quality of life for New York City uh, citizens, right? So we're indicating here, based on research others have done, uh, including the city itself, that uh, air pollution is a significant environmental health problem. Um, alle alleviation of that could have substantial uh, quality of life uh, benefits. And in addition to that, those quality of life benefits would fall most heavily, uh, would benefit most heavily what are known as kind of like frontline communities, um, which are typically neglected uh, or often neglected in uh, plans for climate change. Um, so uh, as an example here, we're indicating that um, the, the 12 most heat vulnerable neighborhoods are high poverty people of color communities. Uh, that's significant because when extreme weather events occur, um, such as the heat wave of 2013, which is uh, the peak all time system peak energy consumption moment of the city of New York, uh, when such extreme heat waves occur, um, you have energy surface uh, blackouts um, and energy surface reduction, though, though that falls most heavily on these types of um, on these types of communities. So, uh, solar solar energy uh, infrastructure obviously um, is capable of generating electricity exactly at the peak moments, um, exactly during the the hottest times of the day, um, or at least during the summer months. Um, which could help alleviate some of those issues. So JB, just uh, please move to the next slide. So um, shifting gears a little bit, what I thought I'd do, we've kind of shown you results and illustrations of what solar cities could mean. Um, what I thought I would do is kind of go in a little bit more detail about how you could approach uh, this type of question, right? So as, uh, as JB indicated, um, the main data source that we've used for this type of assessment uh, is called LIDAR data, it's light detection and ranging uh, data. So it's essentially airborne surveillance or airborne surveying of a city um, using a laser and that generates uh, a high resolution profile of the city. So you can kind of see it in these, in these images here. So here we have the city hall of Philadelphia. Um, so if you have this type of data, you can create a 3D point cloud, similar as was shown before. And from that point cloud, you can generate different uh, profiles, right? So different relationships between one data point and the next. Um, and then within aggregations of data points, which eventually become rooftops to the surrounding environment. Um, so that type of information allows you to map an entire city uh, fairly, uh, conveniently, so we can do a, like a million buildings in New York, you can build a 3D model for, um, and then it allows you to also have an understanding of the performance of, for instance, the solar energy system 
um, over time, right? So you can model different moments in the year uh, for shading and for other uh, components of, uh, of the city. Um, so typically what you would try to realize is at least about a square meter pixel size. Um, so you can actually observe uh, obstructions on the roof, for instance, that are roughly of that dimension. Uh, it's so, so it's much smaller than that becomes challenging unless you have really high quality uh, LIDAR data, which is becoming more and more available. Um, so essentially what you do with the data is you try to get an understanding of the shading uh, profile of the city, um, the slope, so the, 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 yeah, the slope of, of rooftop segments. Uh, so the, basically the height difference from one pixel to the next, to the next, to the next gives you an, an incline estimate. Um, and then the orientation of the roof. So you can understand which way the roof is facing. Um, so those are kind of like the, the morphological conditions that LIDAR data allows you to understand. Um, and then you have a set of heuristics and design principles for solar energy infrastructure in general that uh, you can apply to get an understanding of what kind of system could you fit if you know the dimensions of, for instance, the size of each module and how many inverters you need and things like that. You can, you can come up with, an, with a system design specific to uh, that area that you've investigated. Next slide, please. So what I thought I'd do is show uh, some example overviews that, that you can create with this, right? To, to hopefully go from a little bit of the more abstract to a little bit more of a practical overview. So what you see here is a shading profile for the city of New York. So this is the Manhattan area. Um, and what you see with this type of high resolution data is that you can actually uh, identify separate features visually. Um, most of the analysis, I've actually pretty much all the analysis is done computationally, um, but this visual tool helps you to understand kind of what, what it is that you're creating. So you can see, uh, for instance, a set of trees in the lower left here, but even on individual rooftops, you can see uh, obstructions or uh, features like uh, water towers or uh, HVAC systems that are located on each rooftop. And then obviously the shading assessment that you're doing uh, allows you to understand the shading profile cast by each building. Um, you're basically just moving the sun around and you, you see uh, how much shading is cast by each building. But this is for one hour, uh, one snapshot moment of the day but you can obviously do as many increments of time as you would like to do, uh, assuming you have the computational um, uh, resources to do so. So that's the shading. So click one further, please. So similarly, um, you can understand the slope dimensions, like I said, by, by looking from one pixel to the next and understanding the height between each one. So uh, this is a little bit more zoomed in into the same area of the city. Um, what I wanted to showcase here is that uh, red here means the, the highest slope and green means ref, roughly flat uh, space. So you can quite clearly see the outline of each building, which helps with, with the identification of buildings and the segmentation from one building to the next. Uh, you can see that some buildings, especially like we're looking at Manhattan right now, most buildings have a lot of rooftop features uh, in Manhattan. Um, for instance, towers or uh, other features on top. So you see there's quite a lot of uh, smaller features that you can identify using this technique on each roof. But you see also some roof, rooftop spaces that have uh, more or less empty space um, with some small obstructions on top of it. So but that's a pretty useful uh, view that you can have. So if we go one further. Um, so then the final view that uh, you can create, or uh, you can create additional ones, but these are the three primary ones that we use, um, is the aspect, so the orientation of the rooftop uh, segments. So when you have very busy rooftops, uh, you get a lot of different orientations, obviously, right? Each, each side of a feature has a, has a different orientation, but what you can kind of see for the ones that are not so... Uh, uh, not so busy, you can identify different uh, segments of the roof that are pointing in different directions, right? So here you have, for instance, 
a smaller building that has four separate uh, directions, uh, so facing in, in different, uh, different ways. And so you can limit in your assessment, you could say you could limit it to, um, limit it to um, the different areas that you're interested in, right? So if you're saying I want South, I just realized that you're probably not seeing my mouse, but um, the, you, can, you can essentially see the different uh, directions of rooftop orientation um, and that uh, you can select from that and uh, eliminate the ones facing north primarily or northwest or northeast. Okay, next, uh, next click, please. So, um, yeah, so essentially, so we've, we've applied this uh, method in a variety of different cities. We've shown you the results for New York City, but we've uh, looked at quite a few other locations as well. And basically the, the, the lesson you can kind of extract from that is that um, the solar city profile is common for the urban environment across the world. We found for Seoul, New York City and cities in Europe, for instance, we found similar results in, in what we've shown here today, um, where you can transform a city towards uh, being able to generate significant amounts of electricity if you pursue this type of strategy at the infrastructure scale. Um, so essentially it could become a project, uh, an urban project uh, of transition and transformation uh, that is available to all cities uh, as far as we've looked at. And there's, there's quite a large number of other research teams that similarly look into these kinds of questions. And they've looked at many more cities uh, in addition to these. Um, and the finding is roughly similar um, across all those, uh, all those cases. So, so to conclude, so JB mentioned at the beginning of the presentation here that you can kind of characterize the urban uh, activity sphere, the urban experimentation that we're seeing as a polycentric system. So uh, individual cities working together, uh, competing against each other, collaborating um, in the pursuit of a renewable energy transition, right? So um, what you see here is an example for Massachusetts and California. Uh, both states have embarked on uh, allowing cities and communities and counties to formulate their own energy uh, transition strategy and to make energy decisions on behalf of their citizens. So it's a community-based effort at the community scale. Um, and what we're showing here is that these uh, clean energy authorities are procuring electricity uh, from solar electricity. Uh, so they're selecting that specifically. Um, and you see the growth pattern over time. So there's a movement um, of about 160 plus cities in Massachusetts and about 200 cities in California that are uh, pursuing uh, the type of vision that we've laid out here today. Um, so when you compare that against uh, their, their incumbent utility, um, so next, uh, next click please. Jerry. Yeah, and just quickly, Yop, I just wanted to add on this one point you can also see how fast they can go. So between 2015 and 2019, roughly four to five years, these, uh, these two states increased their provision of solar energy by six fold from these sources, from the, uh, the, the cities and uh, the county. So that market, the city and county market, six fold in roughly four years. Right, yeah, yeah, that's an excellent point. Um, so, uh, what we did is uh, compare this effort, this city level effort against the incumbent utility in either state. Um, so on the left, you see for California, you see the CCE uh, in yellow. So this, this community level uh, solar procurement level uh, effort in yellow compared to PG&E, Pacific Gas and Electric in purple. And you see that in 2019, these uh, community level efforts for the 200 cities that are involved uh, procured roughly three times more than PG&E did for, uh, for solar. So, so there's a clear transition uh, going on. Similarly, so in Massachusetts, uh, where we're comparing the CCEs against uh, another incumbent large scale uh, investor owned utility Eversource. And you see that these cities combined have eclipsed uh, 
uh, the incumbent utility. So there's essentially a takeover or a replacement process on the way uh, where the community scale decision-making is overtaking the authority of the investor-owned utility to make uh, uh, decisions about the energy vision and the energy future of the United States. So this is to illustrate that the solar city vision could fall within this type of movement uh, where cities are actively exploring their uh, energy futures and are actively making decisions. Um, and when you tally it all up, it's, it's of a significant scale um, and speed. So that's uh, uh, the end of our presentation. Um, Thank you guys so much, JB, Joe, that was fantastic. Uh, really interesting. And um, uh, let me just note uh, as we move on to Joe's talk now that there are several questions in the Q&A box that you guys can uh, just type answers to here uh, that are specific to your, your methodology. Uh, and so I, I know that people would appreciate uh, getting some answers to those. Uh, our next speaker is Joe Nyangon. Uh, Joe is a uh, senior industry consultant for power and utilities innovation uh, at the SAS Institute. And uh, he's gonna uh, present to us this morning on, uh, whoops, what happened to your presentation? It was there, distributed solar and the future of the grid. So uh, Joe, please uh, take it away. Oh, hey, uh, can you all hear me? Yes, we can, that looks great. Great, yeah, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Clark, for that introduction. And thanks again, uh, JB and uh, Yob, it's great to see you. I've worked with this team uh, for a very long time and I've learned quite a lot uh, working with them on different projects which are very innovative with respect to what's happening at the city level, as well as how uh, climate uh, uh, policy can be reoriented to better serve cities as well as communities in a more meaningful uh, manner. So it's great to see you again today. So uh, uh, in this presentation, um, I'm going to uh, discuss the growing interest in distributed uh, solar and some of the ongoing uh, transformation in the US uh, electricity market. I'm then going to discuss uh, electricity integration and grid uh, decarbonization issues, including common interventions, which are currently in use to support higher integration of high levels of distributed solar. And the presentation that JB and uh, Yob have just given is actually a good segue to what I'm going to discuss because it gets into some of the technical issues in terms of how can we address uh, uh, these issues. So, and then lastly, I will discuss a few case studies which I'm currently working on here at SAS to enhance grid resiliency uh, and flexible generation of uh, distributed solar and how you know DER technologies, distributed energy technologies like electric vehicles as well as energy storage, microgrids can be in interconnected in a larger uh, quantity uh, to the grid. And if we still have more time, I'm going to also discuss some of the ongoing concerns in a just uh, energy transition, such as the role distributed solar uh, can play in advancing equity as well as inclusion uh, and supporting local communities, businesses, as well as uh, uh, workers, basically supporting lo the local economy. Just to confirm, you are, you're able to see my slides advancing, right? Yes. Yes, we okay. are. Uh, so if you had a crystal ball, what do you think your neighborhood is going to look like in the future from an energy perspective? Uh, will it be the same as it is today? Or maybe uh, we will see more widespread adoption of uh, energy technologies like residential roof rooftop solar or even electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Now, according to the 2021 State of the Electric Utility Survey report, which was just released early this week by Utility Dive, the top issues for utilities uh, today 
are mainly renewables, how to integrate high renewables into the grid, uh, grid reliability and resiliency issues, as well as some of the business operations that touch on cybersecurity, how do you address cybersecurity concerns? And, th and then issues to do with transactive energy, making the energy more transactive as you have more consumers becoming uh, producers. So you're generating prosumers, so to speak. And then workforce management is also a major concern. Now, several recent reports, including by a team of experts from the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and uh, Medicine, uh, the University of uh, uh, Colorado at Boulder, as well as by Sustainable Development Solutions Network led by Professor Jeffrey Sachs of Columbia University, agree that achieving 100% renewable energy by 2035 is going to be quite challenging, but it is an achievable goal. Now, our host, Professor Clark Miller, was a committee member of the National Academies of uh, Sciences report. And uh, if you haven't read that report, I would encourage you to read it because it's such a well-detailed report that sets a scene in terms of how to address decarbonization issues. The report also offers very specific decarbonization policy blueprint uh, of action in terms of creating a technological and socioeconomic baseline of success uh, for achieving a net zero emissions goal by the year 2050. I really enjoyed reading that report. Uh, so what is also clear from these reports generally is that policy innovations at the local, state, as well as federal levels are driving decarbonization in the electric, electric, electricity sector, but more, uh, more uh, effort is being seen at the city level, like, your, uh, like JB and Yob have just discussed. And there is need for these policies to be sequenced in a manner that promotes the synergies between climate goals, as well as resiliency, and also promoting economic development at the local level. And so the good news is that we have seen tremendous progress in grid decarbonization policies as the falling levelized cost of uh, wind as well as solar and lithium ion batteries uh, have made these technologies incredibly competitive in various electricity markets throughout the world, but more particularly right here in the United States, as we've seen in states such as New York, in California, and more recently states like North Carolina, uh, achieving tremendous progress in uh, distributed solar. Now, if you take uh, back, if you look back into the history, the 1960s, 1970s, uh, 80s, and 90s, uh, when it comes to the history of energy, were referred to as the decades of convenience, uh, shortage, austerity, as well as uncertainty. Uh, but the 2020s have become more identified with deregulation and decarbonization, respectively. But the 2020s, this decade that we are in is going to be very crucial for uh, the power industry as the transition toward renewables is going to gain more momentum to increase, is going to increase significantly uh, with respect to capacity additions, which are mostly going to come from renewable energy. Uh, while conventional energy sources like coal as well as other thermal generation capacity are going to be retired in greater quantities. Now, for instance, if you look back at what has happened to the coal industry for the last uh, 10 years, between 2010 and 2019, almost 550 coal-fired power units have been uh, retired, totaling about 100 gigawatts, which is very significant capacity. But I'd like us to take a moment to reflect on how we have really got here. Now, the United States produced more electricity from renewable power generation uh, than from coal for the first time uh, last year. Now, this is actually a milestone that was unthinkable a decade ago when coal was actually a dominant source of energy uh, and permeated a number of sectors mostly used for in sectors such as cement, uh, steel, as well as uh, iron uh, industries. Renewable portfolio standards, RPS, have contributed tremendously to this transformation. RPS are, are implemented at the state level and have been very uh, supportive with respect to uh, what now we are seeing in terms of performance, how cities are outshining uh, 
the federal level or the national level performance with respect to uh, distributed solar generation as well as renewable energy in general. Now, RPS is generally re a requirement on retail electric uh, suppliers to um, supply a minimum percentage of their, um, of their electric load with eligible sources of renewable energy uh, capacity. And they often support industries such as solar, wind, as well as in some cases, small hydro generation capacity. Uh, typically, RPS are often backed by certain penalties and they are implemented at the state level. And as you can see from this graph, they are always designed in such a way that they're never the same in any two given states. Currently, they apply to approximately 60% of all the total US generation electricity sales. And uh, they vary significantly you know, from state to state. Uh, and these variations you know, range from, for instance, targets as well as timeframes, the solar energy carve-outs, as well as the design of some of the alternative compliance payment uh, rates which are required to achieve them. Now, another key related factor to RPS is that uh, most RPS policies have been on the books for quite a long time, you know, on average, more than a decade. But states have continued to make regular uh, and significant revisions. Um, competition uh, between uh, states have, you know, become uh, uh, such a common factor in terms of what is driving these revisions of RPS policy targets. Uh, a good example is what has been happening between California and New York. Uh, California and New York, they seem to be locked in some competition uh, in terms of who, which state is going to be the, provide the most aggressive renewable energy target. Uh, and upward revision of policy targets has become very common experience across major uh, energy policies. It's not just uh, in a, I mean, RPS, we're also seeing this with net energy metering, as well as energy efficiency policy uh, standards. JB and I have just published a paper that looks at spatial energy efficiency patterns in New York, as well as looking at issues to do with energy demand and uh, rebound effect. And one of the policies that we reviewed there was energy efficiency portfolio standard, which also, you know, fits into this uh, uh, bracket of, you know, uh, policies that have seen tremendous revisions. And JB, Yob, and I are also working on a paper, uh, American Divergence in the Greenhouse, where we try to explain the in intransigence of the US to pass a, a national climate policy and how state cities and municipalities, and in some cases, private companies are filling this void by ramping up investment in clean energy uh, policy. Now, so let's take uh, a step back to, and you know, try to see how states are performing with respect to uh, these RPS uh, standards. Generally, competition in the energy sector uh, is good for consumers. Now, if you look at the blue and orange color on this slide, they represent states that have adop adopted or proposed a hundred percent clean energy goal on a timeline that often varies. Uh, between 2040 and 2050. Now, in the world of electricity, this is a very short time frame because, you know, energy infrastructure investments often last between 30 to 50 years, and this is just uh, one cycle of infrastructure deployment. Um, and you see that there are a number of states that have already implemented, or, or rather adopted, or even proposed uh, clean energy goals. And this is already uh, showing in terms of how states are performing with respect to ramping up their uh, distributed solar generation as well as wind energy capacity. And I'd just like to pose a question here. What percentage of total electricity sales do you think comes from states that have 100% clean energy uh, goal? And if you look at, I've just tried to you know, look at put together all the states that have implemented this 100% clean energy goal. And if you add everything up, nearly 35% of total electric electricity sales actually come from states that have already implemented or proposed 100% uh, 
uh, uh, clean electricity goals. And additional 10 to 15% are projected to be added in the near future, uh, in the next five years. Now, in terms of population, almost 40% of Americans are already affected by the 100% clean, clean, clean electricity goals in the sense that they live in states that have already implemented uh, this goal. And 40% population is quite significant. So there's you can see that there's a push to deploy more renewable energy generation. And this is gaining momentum in terms of uh, what we are seeing with electricity sales as well as uh, population cover. Now, if you look at what the Energy Information Administration projections have released with respect to solar and wind, they actually estimate that almost 47% and 34% of renewable uh, electricity generation is going to come from solar and wind, uh, respectively, by the year 2050. Now, this is ahead of geothermal, is ahead of hydros, as well as uh, 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 obviously uh, coal. But the reason that we see these changes is that uh, as they, I mean, as these changes take place, there is also impact in terms of what we are going to witness with, with respect to operational flexibility of the grid, because the grid as it is was not designed for more renewable energy uh, generation, and there has been there hasn't been significant investment you know put in place to ensure that uh, to support uh, a high integration of renewable energy. Now the reason that grid integration is currently very important also is that we see a number of trends across different electricity markets. Uh, for instance, a combination of technological advancement, changing customer expectations, as well as a desire to improve grid resilience. Uh, following what has happened recently in Texas, where there was a significant historical failure in grid, uh, a number of uh, companies, as well as public utility commissions, are coming up with strategies to address uh, or rather to prioritize grid resiliency. And we also see what's happening, especially uh, where companies are pushing more, uh, especially with power purchase agreements, as well as uh, self-generating their electricity. Uh, and this is also going to put more pressure in terms of addressing grid resiliency issues. At the same time, it also turns out that uh, some of the grid modernization efforts, which are actually needed to improve uh, system uh, efficiency as well as resiliency are also the same strategies which are needed uh, to adopt or rather to help integrate more wind and solar into the grid. So there is actually a very nice synergy be between grid modernization as well as integration of high levels of solar and wind. But high renewable energy penetration typically drives uh, high volatility uh, in prices as well as uh, create risk in, in the grid if they are not addressed in a manner that you know helps to different players you know uh, in the market. Now already you can see that the hours when we have more renewable energy generation in these markets, the Southern Power Pool, uh, New York uh, independent system operator as well as California independent system operator and uh, ARCOT uh, Electricity Reliability Council of Texas. Texas now, there is already higher price volatility in these markets. Uh, you can see the hours when there's more renewable, there's greater uh, uh, volatility. Now, volatility in electricity market is equivalent to risk because uh, the potential res result is that higher renewable energy integration, if not addressed, uh, presents greater risk to financing and deploying additional renewable energy generation. Uh, now, additionally, higher renewable energy integration induces transmission constraints and congestion, which could result in increased uh, wholesale uh, price volatility. Uh, congestion in the grid um, is, an, is often you know, looked at from a negative uh, perspective because it depresses the value of uh, electricity that is pushed into the grid. Now, as the graphic shows, power prices trend lower uh, on this graph, this is the, the Electricity Reliability Council of Texas uh, results for August 2019. I try to look for the data for 
uh, December, January, uh, when they had the incident, but that is not out yet, the full data. Now, as the graphic shows, power prices are trending lower as more renewable energy increase in the, in the, in the market. Now, a decrease in average prices reduces profitability of inflexible generation, such as uh, nuclear, as well as uh, uh, solar and wind, to the extent that coal and gas uh, could become competitive. Now, so in a high renewable energy scenario, we can see or rather expect um, higher grid congestion concerns. Uh, and that is the reason why we need investment in the grid to address these issues. So the question is, do we have the right tools to ensure that grid resiliency um, uh, is, is actually addressed in order to uh, encourage high integration of distributed solar? Uh, and this slide shows the types of interventions you know, utilities are using today to address these issues. They range from system operation uh, markets, as well as uh, uh, load issues and flexible generation, as well as networks and storage. Uh, system operation and market responses like DER forecasting uh, is actually what we do here at SAS uh, in the energy division. And they are low capital cost options, but they require significant changes from a regulatory as well as institutional application perspective in order to make uh, uh, high integration of renewables more uh, uh, achievable. Market-based electricity pricing mechanisms, uh, as well as improved uh, electricity market design, are key component of a flexible, as well as efficient and cons consumer-centered energy markets. And flexible generation is also important because some generations are more flexible than others, uh, and flexibility can come from various, you know, it can come in various ways. It can come from physical assets such as batteries, as well as fast tramping natural gas. Uh, plants like comb combined cycle gas turbines, but it can also come from improved operations such as uh, improvement in weather forecasting. So while distributed solar electricity increases a significant variability and uncertainty, utility operators can use these interventions to increase flexibility as well as grid resiliency uh, in a rapidly modernizing grid but this requires advanced modeling techniques that take into consideration multi-day weather events, as well as uh, demand forecasting and grid asset reliability capabilities to improve power system planning. And McKinsey estimates that a typical utility uh, uh, in the US uh, that is located in, in, in states that have got, uh, you know, or other states that are predisposed to weather storms uh, bears a, almost 1.4 billion in storm damage cost and lost revenues over a long period of time, estimated at about uh, uh, 20 to 25 years. Economy-wide, uh, the US Department of Energy estimates that the US bears more than $110 billion uh, impact of these outages annually, while grid-related maintenance costs uh, utilities and their customers an estimated, uh, you know, 52 billion annually. Now, let's look at an example of a project that I'm currently working on to help utilities improve grid resiliency and urban renewal. And this is a project that we are developing. I'm just going to play a video. I hope it works. The electric grid, dynamic, always changing being impacted by wind, rain, storms, and an ever-shifting power load. But what if, for the first time, you could access true conditions-based data that examined these grid dynamics? The grid before the storm, the grid after the storm. What could you learn? What could you do? It's a new level of predictive data, not theoretical data, but conditions-based and actionable all being fed into a SaaS machine learning algorithm. Imagine the possibilities for reducing operating costs, improving worker and public safety, reducing outages, faster storm recovery, even preventing wildfires. And all of these insights and capabilities will be at the tip of your fingers. SaaS Grid Dynamics, powered by Exactor Sensor Technology, 
So this is a, a project that we are collaborating with Exacta, which is an engineering company. And we are developing predictive analytics capabilities to assess grid health with respect to before a storm and after a storm. So we take a snapshot of what happened before and then what happened after, like in the case of uh, uh, Texas. And then we are able to advise utilities on the right mechanisms or strategies to adopt in order to address uh, grid health, also to assess the performance of a number of grid, uh, grid assets, you know, generation assets, as well as transmission assets. Increased frequency of flooding, wildfires, hurricanes, and other environmental catastrophes are going to force a number of cities as well as uh, utilities to reconsider the resiliency and reliability of the existing energy infrastructure. And a tool like this, we believe is going to come in handy in addressing some of these uh, uh, concerns. The other project that we are putting together is what looks at the smart cities infrastructure in general from an analytics perspective, bringing the power of analytics to address the issues that uh, are going to support the development of a modern city. Now, today, modern cities are sprouting with new industrial uh, building as well as residential complexes. The consensus is emerging that dramatic growth in distributed uh, solar uh, and digital transformation of the economy, which are the two mega trends uh, uh, of the 21st century are going to be critical strategies for climate change mitigation, but also uh, strategies for bending the carbon curve, so to speak. And we are working on a number of use cases to support integration uh, of you know use of smart city energy frameworks as well as smart city. Uh, it also issues to do with flood incident prediction and preparedness in order to improve urban planning and better support uh, use cases like community solar as well as uh, uh, some of the solar technologies uh, around DER generation like microgrids. So in conclusion, oh. how do we close the decarbonization, decarbonization curve? And I have a few recommendations in terms of how we can do this based on what we are working on. One is developing a clean electricity standard for electric power generation. Distributed solar plus storage um, is a trifecta of clean, reliable, and resilient energy that can promote renewal of the once neglected cities and urban centers around the globe. We have a number of cities that are facing a number of economic constraints and distributed solar plus storage could be one tool that can be used to create that renewal. And one policy strategy of doing that is through a clean electricity standard for electric power generation. Electrification and efficiency standards for vehicles as well as appliances and buildings are also going to be important. The Biden administration has announced that they plan to build a national uh, network of over 500,000 electric uh, chargers by the year 2030, uh, as well as promoting labor training and installation standards to help this uh, work. And this is going to be very critical if you know, uh, it comes in, in, into being. The other factor is that we need to extend and make permanent you know, uh, credits such as production and investment tax credits for wind and solar. We also need to build and upgrade our electrical transmission facilities to increase overall transmission capacity in order to support uh, distributed solar at the local level, as well as you know, at the national level. But more importantly, we need to revive our digital infrastructure and rebuild dis distressed uh, communities that are facing significant challenges uh, in these areas. Now, thank you very much. And uh, I'll be happy to take any questions uh, later. Thank you so much, Joe. It's clear that uh, the future of <clears throat> electricity uh, is ever more important as we put more and more of uh, the nation's energy load on the electricity sector, uh, as we confront the extremes of climate change uh, and as we uh, integrate all these new technologies into the grid. So I, I am really appreciative of you providing us with that kind of overview of how all of the pieces uh, at least can potentially fit together. Uh, I'm delighted now to introduce our, our final speaker, uh, Christiana Hansberg, who's the 
as I said earlier, the director of the photovoltaics uh, center here on campus and one of the world's top PV researchers. So Chris, please. Um, so thank you um, um, for giving me the chance to uh, look at a little bit of a different view of what photovoltaics, oops. Oh, there we go. A uh, little bit of a different view of what um, photovoltaics can do other than just uh, generating electricity. So all the previous speakers and in the and then the book, it's uh, sort of an extraordinary vision of what um, is possible. And so this is a little bit of a um, view of what's possible, not only with existing technology, but what we can do if we start to change up the technology a little bit. So from, um, I've been in photovoltaics for a long time. And so really one of the major technological successes was the, has been that the demonstration that photovoltaics is a terawatt scale technology, that it's an important component of generating low cost electricity. Now, as I said, um, so, in the previous, let's say, 30 or 40 years of photovoltaics, the goal has always been to generate grid parity electricity. And so it's, um, as we've met this goal, it's becoming increasingly clear that there needs to be further goals for photovoltaics. It's not just enough to have a low cost electricity source. We need to look at what else we can do for it. So the next couple of slides go through sort of some of what the evolving challenges are. So um, photovoltaics met the first challenge of low cost electricity and what else is, um, what else does photovoltaics need to do? So one of the challenges that um, the previous speaker highlighted is that nearly all components of the electricity system are undergoing quite rapid changes. And this is a challenge because the energy system is one of the largest infrastructure systems. And so as an example of how sort of um, significant the um, energy system is in terms of human endeavors. So this is a examination of um, sort of just the miles of lines that needed to be run. So this is the distance between the Earth and the Moon, sort of a, a common metric for, um, for long distances, if you like. Um, if you look at the miles of um, electricity lines that are run, this is a completely, the distance between the Earth to the Moon is completely inadequate. Um, in fact, it's more similar to the distance from the Earth to Mars, but it's very difficult to plot that on scale because um, you just get sort of a little dot over in one corner and a little dot over in the another. So that's um, going back and forth between the Earth and the Moon more than a thousand times. So there's just an enormous infrastructure embedded in the electricity system, and we're going to have to understand um, how to change that. So to again, look at the scale of the changes that's going on. Um, so despite the enormous growth of photovoltaics in the uh, last decade, um, presently photovoltaics generates only a couple of percent of overall electricity. So this means that in the next 30 years, photovoltaics is going to have to go from essentially a very small amount to an area that is larger than the area of the entire road infrastructure in the US. So in the next 30 years, we're going to have to go from a fairly small scale, simple system all the way up to a very, um, a very area intensive one. Um, these are not the only challenges that the energy system faces. So a uh, longstanding challenge and as solar and renewables have come down in cost, one we can increasingly address is um, looking at how we can address um, energy poverty. A final challenge for the um, energy system is that we need to look at the um, decarbonization of not just the energy system, but of the overall system. So here's a sort of a flow chart of how 
the um, greenhouse gases emission, uh, where they come from. A little bit simpler view of that is that um, you can see right here that, um, so again, this is quite regionally dependent. And um, so just a snapshot, if you like, is that uh, electricity generation is, even if we entirely decarbonize the electricity generation, there's a still a substantial number of uh, other areas that we need to address. So given these overall or um, given these overall challenges, um, another factor that we have to take into account is that in the deep decarbonization, um, we have to, I think, start addressing climate adaptation. So even if we do very aggressive targets to some degree, the um, global warming is baked in. And so this provides an additional challenge that we have to address. So what are we going to do to adapt the climate, uh, to adapt human systems to a changing climate? So let's take a look at um, what some of these um, climate um, impacts are. So of course, we're all familiar with extreme weather, the impact on species, uh, water availability, the impact of uh, on people, costs, and food. The ones I've circled in red right here are some of the ones that um, photovoltaics or the development of new photovoltaics can start to um, directly address. Of course, um, we're in Phoenix, and so we focus more on sort of these ones in red rather than sort of the, um, the, the sea, level, um, sea level rise. So some of the types of effects that we get from extreme climate events are excessive heat, the urban heat island effect, um, water stress, ozone, and of course, all of these right here um, exacerbate um, issues with uh, environmental justice. So the, what um, I'll do a very brief overview um, is that if we design photovoltaics to realize multiple benefits at once, then we can go ahead and realize a whole lot better um, outcomes. And so we can address heat and the heat island effect and um, make progress on all of the evolving needs for photovoltaics. So what um, we are, the first one I'll go over and I'll spend the most time of, on this is looking for how we can mitigate the heat island effect in, um, um, mitigate the heat island effect. So extreme heat is the US's deadliest um, extreme weather phenomena. And the mortality from extreme heat is um, actually the highest out of the out of all of those in the US. So here's a plot for the mortality rate on um, heat waves. Um, even these right here are likely underrepresented um, because um, the heat tends to have relatively long term impacts from high temperatures. The heat is um, so the climate change um, intersects with the urban heat island effect. And so you can see on the plot in the um, upper right here that we would expect that climate change to affect more strongly the northern latitudes. And that's what we see right here. But we're also seeing a very in, um, substantial increase in the temperature in the southwest regions. So you can see here that the impacts of the climate change are accelerating in the southwest. Um, as one would expect in if we're increasing the heat in an already hot region, we're also getting a quite significant economic impact from these um, high temperatures. So the uh, looking at the impact of extreme heat, I think I'll go through this very fast in the interest of time. So basically, it's a very it's a tends to be a relatively complex um, area and it um, affects people differently in different climatic regions. So nevertheless, I'll just uh, leave it. I think that um, that the urban heat island effect is extremely significant in regions that already have a high baseline temperature. 
So what we want to do is, um, first of all, we'll, uh, so in order to address the temperature reduction. So one approach is of course, always to use the um, lowest cost and most, um, and the longest acceptable solution. So higher reflectivity roofs, cool pavements, where possible increase vegetation. The increase in vegetation is, is, a, is a, a complicated issue in regions in the desert where it increases water use. And then, but there, there, there's also a possibility to increase the cooling or increase the effect of albedo using photovoltaics. So the albedo of a city is about 20%. Um, you need an albedo, so the albedo is roughly the reflection of about 30 to 35% to remove the heat island effect. So that's sort of the challenge to photovoltaics. So JB, I thought it was really interesting when you said we can put photovoltaics everywhere, or in, I shouldn't say everywhere, um, we can have a high fraction of photovoltaics in the city. And so if we then also use the photovoltaics to promote cooling, then you can um, both generate electricity and and remove the heat island effect. So um, again, uh, this is a um, work from um, Francesco, who is, I think, on the call right here, showing that that photovoltaics um, is the daytime cooling is about half uh, for photovoltaics compared to cool roofs, but the nighttime cooling for PV is uh, roughly twice as large as cool roofs. So what we want to do is be able to increase the benefits from photovoltaics. How do we um, keep them cooler? There is a hierarchy of approaches in this. And so some of these we can implement very, very rapidly. So one is just to change the PV panels to increase the IR reflection. Um, for sunlight wavelengths, this, is a, there's, this has direct benefits and immediate benefits to the photovoltaics and keeping them cooler, giving a little bit higher performance from them as well as um, limiting the heat gain. As and a slightly more novel approach is to increase emissions in the infrared. And so, again, um, I won't go through the technical parts of this. Uh, sort of nanostructured surfaces and a variety of approaches can let us realize this quite rapidly. In the medium term, we can also increase the effect of albedo by increasing the efficiency. And so, of course, this has multiple effects. Um, increasing the efficiency also lets you generate more power, particularly in constrained areas. And so a approach right here is to start moving from silicon to silicon-based tandems. And so the international Technology roadmap for photovoltaics, for example, predicts that um, silicon based tandems will start showing up um, within five to 10 years. And since I can't go through a presentation without med, um, mentioning thermodynamics, a longer term approach is that we can actually control the phonon properties in order to. Um, achieve quite uh, interesting devices. So for example, we can get up to, um, with a photothermionic device, we can actually exceed the efficiency of all other approaches. Um, there's no thermodynamic reason, for example, that you put a, that a, a solar panel heats up when you put it in the sun. It's perfectly possible to have a device that actually cools when you put it out in the sun. And so in the longer term, utilizing these sort of unique physical properties, we can really envision um, a range of approaches. Um, I notice we've only got four minutes left, so I'll, um, I'll move through this very quickly. It's not just limited to, um, or the benefits of integrating photovoltaics into the landscape are not just limited to um, buildings. We can also um, look at approaches such as agrivoltaics, um, and this encompasses a quite variety of approaches. Um, and I just absolutely had to get the picture in. Uh, this has been making these solar rounds recently of um, goats um, 
goats um, frolicking on a PV panel, and I'd note that goats are generally not considered compatible with them. Um, but really some of the, uh, this will be, I'll go through this pretty fast. Um, plants are actually pretty bad at collecting sunlight. So here you can see that they only absorb a relatively narrow portion of the overall solar spectrum. Not only that, um, photosynthesis, um, um, maxes out at about half of a sun. So here's a sort of rate of um, what plants can use. And so at about half a sun, they're actually not using the electricity anymore. So I th um, this is useful not only for integrating photovoltaics with agrivoltaics, but also suitable for looking at areas like um, urban gardens, where you then address multiple goals. You get uh, cooling in the city, you address the food, um, food desert effect, um, as well as giving uh, addressing um, some of the environmental justice issues. Um, I think I'll skip the deep decarbonization just in the interests of time. And so just uh, conclude that um, so photovoltaics have met a very important milestone in showing that they can improve the electricity system, not just in cost, they curtail very easily, you can do power factor correction, so on and so forth. And um, the next goal for photovoltaics is to figure out how to integrate them into human scapes where they not only generate electricity but also achieve other goals such as climate adaptation, deep decarbonization, or um, improving agriculture. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Chris, and really thank you to all of our uh, panelists uh, today. Uh, what, what a fantastic uh, tour de force in terms of um, uh, giving us insights into uh, what the future potential of cities might be in terms of, of meeting uh, their needs, their power needs, but also a variety of other different kinds of needs uh, in the future using solar energy. And so uh, really appreciate everyone uh, being here uh, today with us and answering the, the questions in the Q&A panel. Um, there are uh, two in there. Maybe uh, Joe and Chris could just very quickly uh, take those. One is related to the question of winter and how this plays out in winter. Uh, and then Chris, the one for you is, is related to the question of the urban heat island effect and what the total impact of PV in a citywide deployment would be uh, on that. So uh, maybe JB first and, and then Chris. Okay, I, I thought actually Yoke was going to do it, but uh, Yoke, do you want to you want to go ahead? That's and fine. What happens in the uh, in the colder months? Sure, yeah. Um, so I think so I'm just thinking you could also give some of the work on the other tool that we're trying to develop with building energy efficiency. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So there, there was a little bit of a discussion in the Q and A going on on this already. So um, winter months, uh, it's certainly the case that um, for the New York area, a solar city would be uh, less productive than it would be in the summer months. Um, however, for current electric demand profiles of the city, the, the highest demand takes place in the summer months to try and cool the city. Uh, which is why we kind of raised this, this peak demand um, argument. Um, moving forward, it, it certainly would be useful to have a better understanding of, of the energy consumption pattern in the city. And that, that's research that we are conducting. We are trying to essentially use this 3D model complemented with specific building attributes such as age, uh, use case, um, occupancy, things like that to try and estimate um, its energy consumption pattern, uh, ideally also in, in the interval uh, time frame, so the hourly time frame. So we can get a, a better understanding of uh, energy consumption throughout the, throughout the year, um, energy generation throughout the year, and then uh, energy savings opportunities that might exist, right? So if you have a 3D model for each building, um, so a, a geometry appropriate understanding of the building plus building attributes that, that dictate energy consumption, um, we can start to 
uh, model interventions that lower that energy consumption specifically for that building or for the, for the neighborhood that the building is in. And as such, try to kind of uh, address, uh, for instance, electrification of other functions of the building um, that the solar facility could then help provide the electricity for. Um, so I, so I, in the, in the Q&A uh, panel, I did post one of our research reports on this topic that takes the city of Newark, Delaware, so a pretty, pretty relatively small community, um, but where we modeled each building's energy consumption pattern or estimated each building's energy consumption pattern and, and made um, calculations as, as to how you could have a saving city so energy savings at the city scale in, in conjunction with a solar city. Um, so to, to kind of complement the two, uh, two functions and the benefits they could provide. So I hope that's responsive to the, to the question. Yeah, that was great, thanks. Chris, do you wanna? So during the day, they um, contribute to an increased heat, but at night, the radiative cooling from the panels there. So generally there's a symmetry between something that absorbs um, light very well and something that emits light. Now that's not always inherent and you can actually take advantage of that by making selective admitters. But anyway, so um, in general, there is a symmetry between something that absorbs light and emits radiation. And so PVs uh, showed that they were actually quite effective um, emitters of radiation at night and had, so, um, I think the picture I showed had about twice the cooling at night. Um, in the urban heat island effect, the higher temperatures at night are often cited as an issue. So the short answer is, um, it, it's not a, it, it's, the short answer is that PVs um, generally do are even at the moment are a not a net contributor to the heat island effect and that there are ways to improve that even during the day. Thank you. And again, thank you all for really remarkable presentations. I know I'm gonna be going back once we circulate the video from this and uh, look at going through them again because there was just so much really interesting and useful information there. Uh, you're all doing such really cool work, uh, really important work in terms of uh, transforming the grid to deal with climate change. And as Chris says, a whole bunch of other issues simultaneously. So thank you all for being here this morning. We really appreciate it. And uh, looking forward to the next time. Thank you, Clark, friend, um, JB, for organizing this. This has been, this has been great.